can't sing much, but I'm going to sing till that day. I'm going to keep going. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We appreciate this and appreciate him honoring God and obeying God. And the Lord will bless everybody to be obeyed and want to help. Amen. <laughs> Until that day. Go on singing. Well, you got, this world don't have nothing to offer us in hell. Right? You're right. In the world you'll have tribulation, Jesus said. That's right. But in me you'll have peace and said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm proud we have victory today. We're not working toward victory. We're working from victory. That's right. Victory is one at Calvary. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what time it is. Well, it's not very late. Phil, you sang a song. We were for Avery. Avery, Avery's going to preach for us tomorrow. And, uh, Thank God. Amen. Appreciate that door. Amen. That was good. You know, I'd rather have a song down in here than not that you didn't sing it good. But there's been seasons in my life I didn't have a song down in here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Boy, a whole lot rather have one down in here. Yeah. In a day. That one come out. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You're right. Woo. You're right. Well. Yeah. You're right. Thank God. He's all I need. When I just need someone to talk to. He's always there to hear my prayer. Each time I call him all my needs, he supplies my thirsty soul. He satisfies, he's the Lord of all, and he's all I need. He comforts me when I'm weary. He eases every pain, fills my deepest longing, time and time again. He's my soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. He's my everything, and He's all I need. He's all I need. I need not turn to any other. For he's a friend, a friend who's closer than a brother. On this friend, I can rely to be my strength. As life goes by, he's the Lord of all, and he's all I need. He comforts me when I'm weary. He eases every pain, fills my deepest longing. Time and time again, he's my soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. He's my everything, and he's all I need. He's all I need. I need not turn to any other, for he's a friend. <laughs> A friend who's closer oh, yeah. than a brother. Yeah. On this friend, I can rely to be my strength. As life goes by, he's the Lord of all, and he's all I need. He comforts me when I'm weary. He eases every pain, fills my deepest longing, time and time again. 
He's my soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. He's my everything, and He's all I need. I said He's my everything, and He's all I need. Isaiah chapter 64. <clears throat> when your friends have left you and your family's left you, yeah. Jesus is still standing right there. Brother Steve, he ain't never left me one time. Yes, sir. Never will. He never let me down. Right. He never let me fall. Right. He's always caught me before I hit the ground. Oh yeah. Woo. That's right. If something don't turn over on the inside of you, I might want to check up this morning. Oh yeah. God's been too good to me. Yeah. That's for sure. Yep. Right. I want to read one verse out of Isaiah 64 and bring it with the Lord's laid on my heart. This message has been on my heart for several weeks now, and. Uh, the Lord really just gave me, I guess you could say, the green light to go ahead with it. And uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. It's a blessing to me just to even get to study this out. And uh, I hope it's a blessing to you this morning. I'd like to ask you to stand in the reverence of God's Word this morning. Isaiah chapter 64, <clears throat> verse number 8. It says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay, and Thou art Thou our potter. And we all, we all are the work of Thy hand. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. Yep. We are the clay, and Thou our potter. And we all are the work of Thy hand. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank You again for the blessings of another day. Thank You for having heard Nancy's prayer and watched those throughout the week this past week. God, but now that it's preaching time here in the Sunday morning service, God, I pray that You'd hide me behind the old rugged cross of Calvary. God, that they wouldn't see me, but they'd see You high and lifted up above anything that we could ask or think this morning. God, what a wonderful service we've already enjoyed. God, I'm thankful that You answered prayer about the spirit wind blowing through this place this morning. God, I want to thank You for that. I want to thank You that the Spirit of God is still alive and well. God, I want to thank You for Jesus. I want to thank You for Your Son. I want to thank You for the cross. I want to thank You for the resurrection. God, I want to thank you for all that you've done for me and my family this past year. God, I want to thank you for everything that you've done for us just this past week. Just this morning thus far, God, you've encouraged my heart. And God, now that it's preaching time, I pray for that old time Holy Ghost, heaven sent unction and power that the old timers prayed for. And Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning, that they wouldn't see me, but they'd see you high and lifted up. And God, I pray that some lost soul might get saved this morning, a backslider get right with God, the saints get encouraged this morning. And Lord, for all that you do, we'll be sure to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, for it is in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The <clears throat> book of Isaiah has some interesting uh, verses, I guess you could say. Uh, we've been reading through the book of Isaiah here uh, every, I believe it's every Thursday or every Friday, I read through the book of Isaiah, read a few chapters here and there in that book of Isaiah. And uh, I was reading and studying a little bit on this passage here the other week, and uh, I was studying on the potter and the clay. And you know, this is the verse that the Lord really laid on my heart for this thought of the potter and the clay. But the way of introduction, I want to go through this verse and point out a few things before we uh, get into the main thought. But first of all, the Bible says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. I see the present action. The present action that is, that is described here in this verse. It says, But now. That's right. But now, O Lord, Amen. Thou art our Father. You see, Brother Scott, the day that I got saved, it didn't take a week, it didn't take a month, it didn't take a year down the road. It was in that moment. But now He became my Father. But now He became your Father. But now. It's, it's just a simple fact of the matter. Those two words mean a whole lot. You may say, Preacher, those are simple words. Yeah, I'm a simple preacher. But those two simple words mean two big things to me. That moment that God came down to my heart, He saved me. It didn't take a week down the road. It didn't take a month. But it was in that moment. Moment, but now thou art our father. He became my father and he is still my father. That present action that came down into my heart. He is still our father. He was our father and he still will be our father. That present action. But I see second of all, it says we are the clay. 
I see the present assignment. The present assignment. Brother Scott, when he picked me up off my face, I was in a deeper mess than I'd ever seen before in my life. I didn't know what to do, didn't know where to go, didn't know, didn't know how to live my life, didn't care nothing about what the church thought about me, didn't care nothing about the world, what they thought about me, didn't care nothing about what anybody thought about me. But God, he looked down at that broken vessel. He looked down at that, that mired clay and he saw, he saw something special. He saw something that he could remake. He saw something that he could make something special. And I thank God every day. I thank God every second of every day of my life that he saved me from a devil's hell. He saw something that I didn't see. He saw something that nobody else seen in my life. My life was destroyed. My life was down in sin. My life was destroyed and nobody could have ever seen anything good come out of my life. But God, he looked down through time and he seen something better for my life. Thank God. But he had an assignment. When he saw me, he seen a broken man. Yeah. He seen a broken boy. Brother Scott, when he found you, he seen a broken man. Yeah. Anybody in this room tonight would say that when he found me, he found me at my lowest. When he found me, he found me when I was broken. When he found me, he found me where I didn't know where else to go. And he had a present assignment hey, to fix God. you up. Hey, God. But not only that, it says, we are the clay and thou our potter. Right. Yeah. I see the present artist. There was somebody that had to make something broken look a little bit better. You know, when an artist starts doing a painting and things, they, they, they sort of do like a little sketch of what they're actually going to paint, what they're actually going to do before they actually make the finished product. They, they do that sketch, they put it on paper, they put it on their canvas of what they're going to paint. And before long, that picture that was once in black and white is now in full color. Yeah. That's what he did when he saved my ever dying soul. I was in black and white, deep down in sin. Yeah. And when he saved me, he painted me and made me a pretty picture hey. for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Yeah. <clears throat> but not only that, look at what the last part of the verse says. It says, and we all are the work of thy hand. Right. I see his present accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. See, my God can do the impossible. You're right about it. Brother Scott, he found me when I was broken and beaten and battered by sin. But you know what he did? He done the impossible. Brother Steve, I forgot to tell everybody, but Brother Steve and my dad and uh, Brother Al, Thursday night we went to the jail and we preached in the jail, sung a few songs. About a 65-year-old man walked up to the fence to me that night and said, Preacher, I've never been saved. And I said, Well... I can't do it for you. And he said, but I want to be saved. Yeah. He walked to that fence yeah. that night. I said, sir, I can't do it for you. Yeah. I wish I wish I could touch you and you'd be made whole. But the only one that you can do is you can go to Jesus. You can get down on your knees at night. Yeah. And I'll pray with you. I'll show you how to be yeah. saved. But by the grace of God, that man stood up. And I asked him, I said, how do you feel? Do you feel any different? And he said, I feel a whole lot different. I think I'll be all right. And he got up that night, about a 65-year-old man, on his way to a devil's hell. And God still done the impossible in his life. God can and he still will. That goes to show that man, I don't know what he had done, Brother Steve. I don't know why he was in there. I don't know. It don't matter to me. But he got saved that night. I seen it in his eyes. When he came down, he was weeping. He was weeping and crying and didn't know what else to do. He came down to that fence, looked me dead in my eyeballs and was crying. I'd never seen so much sorrow in all my life. He got up. And then were tears of joy when they were coming out when he got up. And for a few minutes this morning, I want to preach on this thought of taking the broken and making something beautiful. Yes, sir. Taking the broken and making something beautiful. First thing I see is the potter's product. The potter's product. Our verse says that we are the clay. Jeremiah 18 and 4 says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel I seen good to the potter to make it. You see, when he found me, I was crumbled up, crushed, destroyed, down and out, didn't know what else to do. But God came to me and he seen something that was broken. Yeah. He seen something that was marred by sin. He seen something that was black, something that was cracked, something that was broken a million pieces. And he made something beautiful out of it. For the glory of God. For the glory of God. 
I got to I got to reading and studying about pottery and pottery there are a wide variety of different clays and materials to use uh, with different properties to distinguish themselves the clay that the potter chooses uh, depends on what they want the finished product to look like or feel like yep. depends on what they want the finished product to feel like or look like yes. Amen. Right, son. Yeah. I don't know about y'all but that turned something over on the inside of me <laughs> that God would pick me to do his work that God would pick me to even do anything for him after all the stuff I did in my life before I got saved all the stuff that I did I'm ashamed of everything I used to be and why God would use me that's beyond my comprehending that is beyond anything that I could ever think and I can tell you this afternoon that God will use anybody if he can use me but in pottery there, there's three processes in pottery the first one is the carving process. The carving process. This potter puts it on its wheel, whatever material they've chosen, whatever they've chosen to put on that wheel, and it's beginning to spin. They begin to carve it in what they want it to be. Right, right. In their desired shape of what they want it to be. For an instance, if they're making a vase, they want to shape it into a vase. They want to go dip in at the top and come up at the top. Right. Yep. That's how they're going to make it. That's how they're going to carve it. Yes, sir. God's seen something when he's seen me that he could carve into something better than what he had. Right. You see, when I got into the hands of the potter, yeah. not just any potter that you can find out on the street, the potter, yeah. the potter, yeah. Yeah. the potter, the one that's seen something that was just a balled up mess, something that was just crumbled up and broken down by sin, something that was just absolutely destroyed by everything that had ever happened. Yep. And he began to put me on his wheel. Yes, sir. He began to carve me in what he wanted me to be. Right. I ain't always been what I should be. I ain't always been what I should be. I'll say that with an honest truth here this morning. I ain't always been what I should be. I ain't always been what I should be. But we all got room to be better. We've all got room for improvement if we're being honest. If we're being honest this morning. We could all read or pray a little bit more. We could, we could all come to church a little bit more. We could all do a whole lot more for God. But there was something about that time when he put me on the wheel and began to rub his arms across me, make me smooth and carve me in what he wanted me to be. He carved me into the desired shape that he yes, wanted me sir. to be. Good preaching. Good preaching. You see, each preacher has a desired shape that the God made them to be. Right. Each teacher has a desired shape of what God them, made them to be. person that sits on a church pew may not, may not play an instrument, may, may not even sing in the choir. God had a desired shape for them also. That's right, brother. He had a desired shape. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher, a singer, an instrument player, Sunday school teacher, maybe just a little kid sitting on the pew. God has a design for your life. Right. See, when you're building a house, you know what you start out with? A blueprint. Yes, sir. Of what you want it to look like. Right. Got that feeling that God seen something, a picture far off, and he looked down at me and he was like, huh, I think I can make that. Yeah. Come on. I think I can make that. You see, there's the carving process, but not only that, this is the one I really like. There's a curing process. Yes, sir. There's a curing process. This is probably where I'm going to bear down for a little bit. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I'll even get this whole preach this morning. There's a curing process. You know what they do with pottery once they've got it, once they got it into that desired shape and all the uh, chunks are beat off of it and it's smooth? They put it in a fire. Yeah. Yep. They put it in a fire. They put it in a fire to cure it, to make it hard. Yeah. That's what God does to us. To get us stronger, brother Steve. You see, if, if the Lord just let us be clay, we'd fall apart real easy. We just, we'd fall apart. That's all we would do. But you see, He put us in that fire to cure us. To prepare us. Right. Prepare us what was up ahead. Right. You see, potters, you know what they do? They, they're, most of them make materials that are meant for everyday use. Come on. That's how God's supposed to make us. Yes, sir. Make us for yes, something sir. that's used every day. Yes, sir. God can use us every day if we'll just let Him. That's all. With, that's not. That's not with quenching the Spirit or grieving the Spirit. You can't do none of that for God to use you. Right. You can't do none of that. Right. But there's that curing process when God when God puts you through a fire and when He puts you through a trial and you wonder why in the world is this happening to me and why in the world would this ever happen to me? God is hardening that clay. He's making it something strong. He's making it something big. That 
that nobody can break. Yeah. You yeah. see, you may say, preacher, I don't understand. I just can't understand why God is letting this happen to me. I can't understand that. I don't know why God is letting this happen to me. I can tell you why. Because he's trying to harden that clay, make it something yeah. for me, for the master's yes, use. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. You may say, preacher, I've been in a fire for a long time. God may just have to be curing you for a little while. Yes, sir. Longer than the rest of them. That's right. You may say, preacher, I just, I just don't understand why this happened to me. Maybe God wants to use you. Maybe God wants to use you for something big. You may say, preacher, I, I just don't understand. God won't let me get out of this fire. But then we go into the next one. There's a covering process. Once it comes out of the fire, they cover it. They paint it. They do whatever with it. See, when I got saved, when He carved me and what He wanted me to be, when He put me through the fire, when He brought me out, He painted something beautiful. And I ain't nothing. I ain't beautiful. You can look at me and tell that. This morning, when He took me out of the fire, He painted something special. When He pulled you out of the fire, He painted something special. And you know what He did? You know what He did? All He did was cover up the guilt and shame that was in your life. That's all He did. He covered everything when God died on the cross that day. It was that one drop of blood that touched you. It was that one drop that covered every guilt, every shame that was in your life. And that was what God did for you. And that's what God did for me. And He can do it for any one of you. He covered the guilt from my sin. He covered the shame of my sin. He covered every sin I would ever do. For the glory of God. See, most potters create functional pieces meant for everyday use. Second Timothy 2 and 21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Let me tell you this morning, I ain't nothing special by any means. I know, I know, I know the carnality in my mind that goes through my mind on a daily basis. I know the wickedness down on the inside of me because of my flesh. I know what I am, and I know what I am, and I'm saved by the grace of God. You see, I want to be used. I don't know about you, but I want to be used to God. I want to be that vessel that when God needs something done, He gets it off the shelf and He uses it. And He uses it a lot. That's what I want to be. But not only the potter's product, there's a potter's personality. See, I begin to study and read on this a little bit. And a potter, potters have distinct personalities. I've never met one, so I wouldn't know if it was true or not. But I really liked what, what it said when I was reading on it. <clears throat> it said potters have a dis distinct personalities. To name a few here, it said they're independent people. They're stable people. They're persistent people. They're genuine people. They're practical people. They're artistic people. They're sensitive people. And the list goes on and on and on of what all they are. The Lord has a personality. The Lord has a personality. First of all, He's omnipotent. He fights for us. On a daily basis, Brother Steve. On a daily basis. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 20 and 4, it says, For the Lord your God is He that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. You see, my God is an all-powerful God. He's the one that's going to be going out fighting for us. You may say, preacher, I've been in this battle for a long time, and I've been in this and been in that and been done this. How many battles have you lost with God on your side? Come on. That's right. Hey. Brother Steve, I could, I could probably say with some pretty big confidence this morning that anybody that's had the Lord in a battle with them has never lost a battle. Because hey. the Bible tells me that if God be for us, who can be against us? That's right. That's and you know what that says, Brother Steve? That tells me that nobody can be against me when the Lord's on my side. And when the Lord's on my side, whom shall I fear? Amen. The Bible says, I believe it's the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, it does comfort me. That's a comfort, that's a comforting word of the Lord, you know. When it talks about that, it talks about, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that I will fear no evil. Praise the Lord. 
See, when the Lord's on our side, we ain't got no reason to fear. We ain't got no reason to be scared. We ain't got no reason to do none of that. The Lord's on our side. We ain't got nothing to be scared of. God's got it all under control. He's got everything under His hand. He's got, all under, he's got everything under His feet. Yeah. I was reading over in Psalms the other day, reading those verses where David said that the devil was under his feet. I was listening to a song the other day, and th this songwriter, he wrote this song, and it talks about being under the feet, under the devil's feet, or under the Lord's feet. And it talks about how that the devil may have a laugh or two, but he won't get the last. Amen. The devil may get a laugh or two of watching you fall, Brother Steve, but he won't get the last. Because the Lord's going to get the last laugh when he puts the devil back where he came from. And when you go down into the bridge of that song, it says, you know, maybe I once was, maybe I once was blind, but now I see. Maybe I once was bound, but now I'm free. Maybe it's time that you get back on down to hell, is what that songwriter said. Thank God tonight, or this morning, God fights for us. You know, when we, this is sort of a weird illustration, I guess, but what, like the military do when they fly them planes overseas and things, they, they step off that plane. There's usually a general or a corporal or whoever, a general, commander, commander-in-chief. They're always standing there waiting for them. When we stepped off the plane of our battle, when we got saved, the Lord was standing there waiting for us. Yes! Amen! Yes, sir! Not only that, not only that, He's omnipresent. He's always there for us. Yes, sir. He's always there for us. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, John 14, 18. It says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will come to you. He'll come running to my rescue. See, you know like He did for Peter, I believe it's old Matthew chapter 13, I believe. When Peter was sinking down, he had seen all the winds and the seas and all the things that were going on all around him. He took his eyes off the Lord. We all know the story. I preached on that before. <laughs> but the Bible says, I believe it's verse number 31. It says, when Peter was sinking, the Bible says, and immediately, immediately, right. yes. he stretched forth his hand. Right. You know, when we cry out to the Lord and we call on the Lord and call on the name of the Lord when we're down and out and feeling like we can't do nothing else and a trial has arose in our life, we call on the Lord and He's always right there. Yeah. Thank God. Hey. I know there's people in here that's had trials. There's people in the hospital out of this church this morning that are probably dying wishing they could be here. Wishing they could be here. You're right. You're right. But God's there with them in the hospital this morning. God's down there at Max Brandon Funeral Home with all the families that lost loved ones this past week. God's down there at Sean Chapman's Funeral Home with all the families that lost loved ones this morning. God's everywhere. God's everywhere at once. That's what that word omnipresent means. He's everywhere at once. He was at my house on 84 Dennis Mill Road this morning. He was in Stanton, Virginia this morning where she's from. He was everywhere this morning. He's everywhere this morning. He's everywhere. He was the same at my house that he was in Los Angeles, California this morning. He's the same at my house as he was in Tampa Bay, Florida this morning. You see, he's there. He's there. He's there when we need him the most. He's there when we don't even need him. When we don't think we need him, he's still there anyway. Hallelujah. Not only that, he's omniscient. Right. He knows us. That's right. He knows us. He knows, Brother Scott, he knows me, Avery Johns, better than I know myself. That's right. And I know myself pretty good. I know I'm about six foot tall, weigh about 150 pounds. About, about that. That's me. That's me for you. I know that about me, Brother Steve. But God knows a whole lot more about me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Come, on. Come on. He knows how I was made. Come on. Yeah. He knows the blueprint of how He made me and what I ought yeah. to be. Yeah. You see, you know the old song. This is sort of this, people want to say, "Oh, this is a little kiddie song." All the little kids sing this. I don't care what people think about this. You know them little kids, they sing, He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took Him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. I love how impatient He must be. He's still working on me. 
You know, if some of us Christians that's been saved for a little while could just get a hold of that, that He's still working on us, there ain't no telling what God would do. He's still working on me, Brother Scott. He's still working on you. He's still working on him. He's still working on Brother Glass. Yeah. He's still working on every single one of us this morning. If we could just get a hold of that. If we could just grasp that and realize that we're nothing without God. And realize that we're absolutely nothing. And that God knows us better than we know our own selves. God knows our name. He knows our frame. He knows the shame that was in our life. He knows all these things this morning. He knows us. He knows us. He knows our ways. Amen. He knows. The Bible says that He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. Amen. Let me tell you this morning, the Lord has a personality of His own. You know, we all have personalities. If any of y'all know me real close, I'm just a cut up and goofy and sort of dumb at times. Be honest with you. If you know if you know anything about me, you know I'm sort of dumb, have a dry sense of humor, and you know try to make people laugh. Don't really laugh most of the time, but <clears throat> you know that's just my personality. You know my dad's personality. He's principal of school. Most people's intimidated by him. Most people scared of him. I know Anna is. <clears throat> you know everybody has a distinct personality. You know I've met people that you know, I didn't really care for their personality. Personalities really stink. <laughs> but, you know, some of their personalities didn't really care for. You know, those people that were always talking dirty. You know, those things, that's just their personality. Yeah. Brother Scott, your personality, you're just a cut up and you, you like to shout and have a good time. Right. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. Amen. Amen. You know, we all have our personalities. Amen. You know, like a kid, they have a personality. They pick their nose and they do all these things. That's, what, that's just what kids do. That's their personality of when they're young. I know, I know Carson's doing that probably right about now. We know we all have a personality. We all have distinct personalities. But you know, there's nothing like the personality of the Lord. There's nothing like the personality of the Lord. You may say, Preacher, why are you cutting up jokes? The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. That's right. Well, yeah. There ain't nothing wrong laughing every once in a while, being dry and down and out, no smiling nowhere. Come on, come on, come on. You know, a joke that goes around in our families that we have the John's look. <laughs> <laughs> and I have it. I was blessed with it. He has it. My dad has it. I ain't never really seen Doyle or Perry with it. But I know I have it. <laughs> I had it this morning when I woke up. I don't like waking up in the morning. I, but you know, we, we have that John's look. That's just a straight face, basically more or less a frown on our face. That, and y'all can say, hey man, it ain't, y'all seen it, y'all seen it, don't, don't act like y'all ain't seen it, y'all seen it. Yeah, you're right. May not have seen it in me, because I smile a lot, I'm smiley. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have those personalities, we have those traits that, that we have as us. You know, nobody can be me. Nobody can be him. Right. Nobody can be Brother Steve. Right. Nobody can be any one of us. We are who we are. Exactly don't try to be somebody else. You're right. You're right. You know, that, 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 that's what happens a lot of times. We want, we want to be like somebody else. You're right. <clears throat> you know, why can't, why can't I be good looking like so-and-so down the road? Mm. Or, you know, why can't I be as tall as them? Why can't, why, why can't I be as muscular as them? You know, why, why can't I be like them? If we would just get down to being ourselves and just getting in tune with God You're right. You're and realizing that God You're made right. us how He wanted us to be hey. made, hey. God would bless us a whole lot more. Hey. But you see, there's nothing like the personality of the Lord. You see, the personality of this potter is, is he, he wants nothing better. He wants nothing but the best when He's finished with His product. Yeah. That's His personality that shows the love and the mercy. You see, there's been times when, when He's carving me and He's and he's making me what I ought to be, that, you know, I've cracked. I've fallen off the wheel. And I ain't perfect. Some of y'all nod your heads. I know y'all ain't perfect either. Don't be Baptist on me this morning. I know y'all ain't perfect. I ain't either. I've fallen off, I've fallen off, I've fallen off the potter's wheel a few times, Brother Steve. I've fallen, I've fallen off and I've hit the ground and I've cracked. 
But you know what he did? He just got some more clay and put it on there. Molded it back, put it back through the fire, brought it back out, painted over the scars. You see, I heard a song the other day that scars are just showing how good God's been. And some of y'all may have more scars than others. I know I have scars of sin in my life. And those are scars that I can look back and, you know, just see how good God's been. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, God has been good to us. God has. This morning we seen Brother Doyle. He probably shouldn't even been standing here this morning. If we're being honest. You know, when we, when we get down, when we just start... Some of y'all just need to go down the road sometimes by yourself, turn the radio off, and just think. Yeah. There you go. That'll do everybody some good every once in a while. There you go. There I know it does me good every once in a while. When I'm driving down, I drive an hour to work, an hour back. Sometimes I just turn the radio off. When I've had a bad day, I turn the radio off, and I just drive home. No talking, no nothing, and I just think. You know, sometimes when I think, it makes me even madder than I was before. <laughs> but then there's those other times that I begin to think. And you know, I'm not as worse off as so-and-so down there. I have it a lot better than so-and-so. You're right. You're right. I'm not sick and in the hospital this morning. You're right, Avery. You know, we take it for granted. We take our health for granted. You're right, Avery. Somebody, somebody help me with that. We take our You're health right, for granted. Avery. You're right. Avery. You know, we, we wake up every morning. We open our eyes every morning. When's the last time you got down on your knees and thanking God for letting Amen. you see another day? Amen. Come on. When's the last time you got down on your knees and thanked God that you had hands and legs? Amen. When's the last time you got down on your hands and knees that, and thanked God that you could see or that you could hear? Amen. I work with a man Come that's on. deaf. I work with a man that's deaf. Come on. And he came to us the other day and he can read lips really well. And that's how he communicates. He can read lips. And he came to me and one of the guys and he said, you know, I can't really read this woman's lips. I need y'all to go out there and talk to her. See, that man has probably never heard anything in his life. And we take our hearing for granted. You're right. Absolutely. Some of us may can hear better than others. I'm deaf. I can't hear nothing. You can ask my family. I can't hear nothing. Even when they're talking to me. I'm huh, huh, what? But you know, I do hear. And I do see. I smell. I can talk. There's a lot of people that can't even talk. Come on, come on. Come you know those people that have had strokes, they can't talk. Right. Come you know, on. we take everything for granted. You're absolutely When's the last time that we came down to an altar or got down on our hands and knees at the house and just asked God or didn't ask God for anything and just thank God for all that He done? That's right. You're right. Amen. You're right. You know, I get in a bad habit of times of just asking God for things. God, help me. Help me with this. Help me with that. Help me with this. Help me with that. When's the last time we got down on our knees and just forgot about what God, what we want God to help us with and just thank God for what He has done? Amen. That's right. The Lord has a personality of His own. And then lastly this morning, the potter's place. Potter's place. As I was studying about potters, many potters, they have their own studio to say. They have their own place of where everything that they've ever made is on shelves. You know, people can look at. People can say, hey, man, that's pretty. That's nice. You know, most of it's probably pretty expensive, but, you know, what would it be like if we could just see what the Lord's studio looks like? Yeah. What all the beautiful things He's made. Yeah, come on, come on. What all the beautiful vessels of God honoring vessels that He's made. Right. I want to look at a few vessels. The Lord gave me a few vessels. There's, first of all, a vessel of honor. Yeah. There's a vessel of honor. And I see a vessel of honor as those God-fearing people. It may not be a preacher, may not be a teacher, may not, be, may, not, may not even sing, may not even do anything. But those people that fear God and want to do anything and everything to please God. Amen. That's a vessel of honor. Amen. That's a vessel of honor. Right. You know, you heard the old saying of uh, giving honor where honor's due. Yeah. Right. There, there's some people in here that deserve some big honor for the vessel that they are for the Lord. Amen. You know, there's some people in here that's here Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, every night through revival. There's people that are every night. There's those people that are faithful. Those people that are here every time the doors are opened. You know, when I, th when I think about faithfulness to church, I think about the justices. Yes, sir. Brother James and Miss Betty Justice. That's right. I think about them when I think about faithfulness to church. That's, right. I, I just what, that's just what comes to my mind. You know, there's been meetings I've been in that I didn't know anybody there. And you know who walked in the door? 
Miss James and Betty Justice. Right. Didn't know anybody in that meeting. Didn't know anybody there except me and whoever came with me. You hear a shout. And then you hear that shout. That's exactly right. You hear that shout. Yes, sir. They've done anything and everything to get to church. Amen. Yes, sir. Every time the doors are open. Right. You know, if we could just be like that. Oh, what God would do in our lives. Yes. Oh, what God would do for us. Oh, what God would do You're if right. we could just be faithful. You're right. You're right. But it's not only being faithful to church. It's being faithful to pray. Yes. He preached about prayer last Sunday morning. That, re that was really good. That was for me last Sunday morning. <clears throat> Brother Steve, there's times when we get too busy. Yes, sir. I get busy. That's true. Man. I get busy. If we're, if we're, if we're going to get down to earth, let's get down where the rubber meets the road this come morning. On, come on. We all get busy. Right. We all get super busy. Ain't got time to do nothing. Ain't got time to barely breathe, Brother Steve. Yeah. But you know, there's some times where we just need to take out a little chunk of our day. Just get down on our hands and knees. Maybe just even whisper a prayer to the Lord. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. Right. Pray without stopping. Amen. If you go throughout your day with a constant prayer down in your heart, I don't know how you could have a bad day. Yep. You know, when you think about how good God's been and how He's blessed your family and blessed you and blessed everybody around you, That's true. And being faithful to pray, you know, it's hard for me at times, Brother Steve, when, when I've had a bad day, I'm like, well, God ain't going to hear me. There ain't no reason getting down on my knees. He ain't going to hear me for everything that I did today. Right. Brother Scott, <clears throat> there's been times where I've got down on my hands and knees, right. hit the roof, hit me back in the back of the head. Right. But you know, he talked about last Sunday morning. There's been times he's felt like that. But you know, he tried. That's right. He tried. If we could just try to pray. Right. May not even get in touch with God. Amen. But if we could just pray. Amen. If we could just try. That's all it would take. You know, you know, fixing cars is something that I like doing. I enjoy what I do. But sometimes they are a real pain. A real pain. And you know, my boss talks to me all the time. He's like, hey, you got that done yet? You got that done yet? He's just joking around with me. Like the other day, about an hour after he had told me to get a transmission out, he said, you got that transmission out yet? I said, no, I ain't started on it. Kept getting busy and busy and more busy. But, you know, there's been times where he's handed me something that I didn't really know how to do. But I tried to do it. If we could just try to pray like we would try to do anything else. Right, right. You know, there's times when our family may be in a, may be in a situation, this is a better illustration than the transmission story because nobody really got that. I can tell by the look on your face. See, when your family's in a jam, when, say for instance, <clears throat> say, Bill, say one of your daughters had a flat tire on the side of the road and you tried everything and everything to get to them where they were at. He tried. You know, we had, a, we had a little situation about her coming to Georgia this week. She wasn't going to get to come. But we were trying and trying and trying and trying to get everything we could to get her here. Yeah. We were trying. If we could just try for the Lord. Hey. If we could just try. Hey. That's all it takes is just hey, to man. try a little harder. Right. Try a little harder. Dig yes, a little sir. deeper. Yes, sir. Dig a little deeper. Hey, man. Dig a little deeper. Not only a vessel of honor, a vessel of hardness. You know, when I think about a vessel of hardness, I think of a preacher's wife. I think of a preacher's wife, Brother Scott. Right. When I think about enduring hardness, you know, Bible, I believe it's 2 Timothy 2 and 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier for Jesus. Yeah. You know, if, if we could just get down to that and, you know, look at the people that's had to endure some hardness. You know, there's been preachers down around this country that their wives have probably endured some hardness. You're right about that. For maybe things that their husbands preached. Yeah. Maybe things that their husbands said behind a pulpit or things that they had to deal with. Right. Their wife still had to deal with it with them. Right. It was just as hard for him Good. as it was for her. Good. And I know there's been times where Mama's had hard times for stuff that you've preached. Where people will probably say, well, why did he preach that? Why is he being hard? Yeah. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? There's been those times. There's been those times. Think about Miss Jimmy Lou Allen. She's had to endure some hardness. Oh, yeah. Miss Edna Ballou's had to endure some hardness. All these great men of God that's passed on, 
they've had to endure some hardness. Their wives have. Right, right. They have. Right. But not only a pre not only a preacher's wife, but I think of a pastor when I think of enduring hardness. I believe a pastor is one of the most busy men ever. They're at the hospital, they're at the funeral home, they're at church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, preaching their absolute heart out for the right. people to look at them like right. a calf looking at a new gate. Right. <clears throat> right. You see, a preacher, uh, a pastor can study and do all these things just for some church member 10 minutes before he gets up to tell them every little problem that's going on in their lives. Come on. Yeah, that's right. You know, it would be hard for some people to get up and preach after somebody had vented to them for 10 minutes about what's going on in their life, but yet a pastor still gets up behind a pulpit every Sunday morning when people's griped and complained about how cold or how hot it is in the church and griped and complained and blah, 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 on and on and on. And the pastor still gets up, preaches his heart out, and tries to help somebody. Yeah, come on. That's hardness. That's enduring hardness as a good soldier for yeah, Jesus. Right. Good son. Good preaching. Not only that, being peculiar. The Bible talks about us being a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That's right. The Bible didn't call us to be popular people. That's true. That's right. That's Brother right. Steve, I quit I quit caring a long time what people think about me. I quit caring a long time ago. You know, I did it when I was in high school, I wanna be the coolest. I wanna be the one that had all the nicest things, Brother Scott. I wanna be that cool guy. Everybody liked. Not most, most people didn't like me anyway, but <laughs> I tried. He got me in trouble. So. Got me in trouble too. <laughs> but you know, Brother Steve, I quit caring a long time ago what people thought about me. You know, when I got out of high school, it, it was real. It was a real wake up call for me. Yeah. You know, I'm growing up. I'm getting older. One day I'm gonna have a family of my own. You know, what would it be like when I had a family of my own right. that if I still tried to be that popular preacher? If I, if, if I preached all them big meetings, there ain't nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong when I say that. Some preachers, that's all they preach in. That's all they preach in. They don't preach in no jail sales. They don't preach on the radio. Right. They don't preach in right. little country churches on the right. side of the road. Right. All they want is in big churches where they can get come their on. big money. Come on, come on. You see, this morning, there's vessels of hardness to endure hardness as a good soldier for Jesus. But we've got to be peculiar people. If we're, if we're ever going to be anything for God, we're going to have to chunk our pride, chunk our popularity, chunk it all. And just be different. You may say, preacher, I don't want to be weird. Be weird. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Be weird for the Lord. Be that person that somebody comes to when something's going wrong in their lives. That they're like, hey, will you pray for me? Amen. Be that person that somebody comes to you. Hey, can I, can I ask you about something? Has something real, really been bothering me? Sure, yeah. Be that person. You're right. Be that different person that when something happens and maybe one of your friends lives down the road, that they call you. Be that person for hey. them. Be that person for them. Hey. But not only a vessel of honor and a vessel of hardness, but a vessel of heroism. You may say, preacher, what are you talking about? Those preachers, prayer warriors, soul winners. Amen. Those are people, those are vessels of heroes. Those are heroes. Amen. You may say, preacher, how are they heroes? They didn't save your soul. Some of them prayed me out of hell, though. You're right. Right. Some of them witnessed to me. Really got a hold of my heart. Amen. Preached to me my whole life. They were my, they're my heroes. Amen. I know, I know there's people that took time out of their busy schedules to pray for me before I got saved. I know that with a fact. Amen. <clears throat> you may say, Preacher, I'm running over. I'm running real late this morning. But there's, a vessel, there's those vessels of heroes, those preachers that have preached their absolute heart out. Souls may not get saved. Saints may not get encouraged. They were still trying to help somebody. Hey! Those soul winners. I, every time I think of a soul winner, I think of Brother David. Brother David is one of the greatest soul winners I've ever seen in my life. I didn't, I didn't ever get to go on visitation. When, some of y'all know how he used to be on visitation better than I did. You see, most, of mo most people, when they go on visitation, they go visit the people that's sick, visit the people that's in the hospital, and there ain't nothing wrong with that. 
Brother David would go to the trailer parks, walk the trailer parks, walk door to door, knock on the door, and ask people that had ever been saved. Right. That, that is visitation to me. Going out into the highways and hedges is what the Bible says. Brother David used to go door to door. He didn't care. He didn't care if people, oh, this old man, he, he's just this and that and the other. He was still knocking on doors every, every third Saturday or second Saturday, whatever Saturday y'all go on visitation. He was still knocking on them doors every Amen. Saturday. Amen. He was faithful to do that. He was faithful to do that. Not only was he going out into the trailer parks, he was going into the jails. Yes, Brother Steve, I didn't get to go to the jail with him. You went to the jail with him. Dad went to the jail with him. Brother Al and a lot of y'all went to the jail with Brother David. Y'all right. seen how he was. I didn't get to see how he was. But I, I've heard how he was. I've heard that he would get down to them prisoners and show them how to be saved. I heard that he would just talk to them. That's a soul winner. You know, if we could ever be a soul winner for the Lord, we're going to have to chunk our pride at a gas pump and try to talk to somebody. We're going to have to chunk our pride at the Walmart and try to talk to somebody about the Lord. You know, my, my, I'm not talking about beating them over the Bible, beating over the head with the Bible. I'm not talking about none of that. I'm not talking about that. But in love, Brother Scott, Amen. walking up to them and saying, Hey, have you ever been saved? Right. Right. Have you ever... Have you ever Felt the Lord? Have you ever have you ever got saved? Have you ever been born again? And I ain't talking about beating them over the head with a Bible. That's what some people do. That's what some people do, and that's the wrong way to do it. But if you just go to them in love, right. say, hey, have you ever been saved? And if they say no, well, I'll be praying for you. That's all it takes. You may have sowed the seed in that person's life. I believe it was Paul over in Corinthians said that I planted in Apollos slaughtered, but it was God that gave the increase. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. You see, Paul may have been that man, you know, just probably just sort of sat around and have you ever been saved? He planted that seed in a lot of people's lives. Right. I mean, he preached too. But then he, he went over to Apollos and Apollos watered the plant. Then God gave the increase. Amen. That's how he done. That's how he done for me and you. <clears throat> this is the last thing, and I'm done this morning. The potter has selected to use someone this morning. Do you want to be used of God? Do you want to be used for something special that the Lord, that only the Lord can do? Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Sandy, if you'll come.